Earlier this year, a report came through of a bird that had been attacked in a random act of cruelty. It was somehow surviving with an arrow through its body, but would soon die if it wasn't rescued. Wildlife rescuers attended almost every day, but despite their huge effort, the bird remained in this condition for over a month because catching these birds is notoriously difficult. With its condition getting worse, I thought maybe we can build something to not only capture him, but also to help rescue other hard to catch birds in the future. Now I haven't shared much about this on my channel, but over the last couple of years, my wife Kristen and I have been making some time to volunteer in wildlife rescue, mainly focused on seabird and waterbird rescue. I got into this partly because I want to help local wildlife in my area, but also because I thought my good deeds might please the seagull gods, who might then persuade their spore not to defecate on my car and my shed. But it's been amazing to see how passionate and dedicated all the volunteers are, with many falling into their own specialty areas. And I guess because of my obscure skill set of working on devices that scare animals away, this has translated surprisingly well into working on devices to rescue them too, landing me a role of helping with rebuilding, testing and maintaining these net launches, which seem to break a lot. But despite the maintenance these things seem to need, they are so handy for rescuing birds before their condition gets worse. Especially for hard to capture water birds like the Australian white ibis. Now, if you're Australian, you'll probably be yelling bin chicken at the screen right now. And if you're not, this is a name they are commonly referred to due to their affection towards bins. But what you might not know about the Aussie white ibis is that they are pretty bloody smart. For example, they are the only Australian animal that has worked out how to process and eat invasive cane toads, which are poisonous to everything else in Australia. Plus, they are as cute as hell when young, like Elvis here. But here in Western Australia, where they are not often found in urban areas, their intelligence makes them very scared around humans. Which brings us back to our Ibis named Aaron. For over a month, he's been surviving like this, which would be the equivalent of a human having a pool scoop handle skewered through their body. The local rescuers and property owner made a huge effort to capture him. They tried using nets and leg lines, but the bird became more and more scared of their presence. Despite regularly enticing him with food, they couldn't even get him within net launcher range, which is limited to about 5 metres. So my plan is to make a remotely activated net launcher, which will be monitored by camera. We can then be hiding far away from the capture site, allowing the ibis to freely walk up to the bait, and we can then deploy the net. The easiest way would be to use an existing handheld net launcher like this, and then just trigger it with some kind of remotely activated push the button down thing technology device that I can't remember the name of. But the problem is with these is they work by compressed CO2, which comes in these little canisters, which I should point out is different to those similar nitrous oxide canisters that pastry chefs sprinkle everywhere through suburbs like fairy dust for some reason. But with these, a CO2 charge is placed in the back chamber, which is pierced when closed, pressurizing the launcher. When the trigger is pressed, the CO2 is released, pushing the weights out of the barrels and launching the net. The problem is though, if the trigger isn't pressed, you only have about 10 minutes of standby time before the CO2 starts to damage a net launcher, and will likely need much longer than 10 minutes. So instead of CO2, I'm thinking we use a bigger air tank and just fill it with regular old breathing air, which I can then put in an electric pump and use to fill the tank. So to test the idea out, we'll be reintroducing an old friend from one of my past videos, which you may remember, Hello, Thomas the I'm Accumulator Thomas. Tank. Then for the valve to release the gas, like in the past, we can just use a sprinkler valve, which can be wired for remote triggering. After I dusted Thomas off, I put the sprinkler valve back on and charged him up with the air I collected earlier. Perfect. If all we want to do is throw a pair of jocks really high in the air, but we need to launch a net. So usually with a net, you'd launch four weights, which can leave some escape opportunities for a bird. I reckon we should take inspiration from how researchers capture large flocks of birds by using explosives to blow the shit out of them. Is what I thought at first, but apparently they use rockets or mortars to fire weights and a big net over them. I'm thinking we use an existing weighted net. We can remove two of the four weights and peg one edge to the ground. Then all we need to do is launch the other two weights over the top, which should hopefully make the net open nice and consistently. To act as barrels for the weights, 
I found that this tube from my pool fence was the perfect size, so I cut down the fence into sections. Also because I think it's cruel to keep a pool locked up behind a fence. Then I'll just have two barrels splayed in a V shape so the weight spread out when it fires. Now, as much as I would have liked to have used Thomas the Tank, I feel that he's a bit too big for this project, so I'm going to remake a smaller version. I was going to use pressure rated PVC, but for some stupid reason they accidentally put way too many numbers next to this dollar sign for the size that I want. So I'm going to make my own, for less out of shiny plastic. I managed to steal this nice piece of polished stainless steel from a mate. Not only is the size perfect, but it's very shiny and enjoys pats. Then to go on the ends of the tank, I sourced this piece of blue square tube, which I then ironed flat. It also enjoys pats. Sadly, I then had to scratch the stainless steel to cut our tank to length. I thought it would be a good idea to check if the steel tube and a ruler wanted to be friends. They did. I've then traced the ends onto the flat sheet of steel, but I don't have any decent way of cutting circles out of steel, so it was just lots of straight cuts with the cutting disc which I'm pretty sure is how they make stop signs. While I did this, at some point, Kristen and another volunteer, Rachel, had rescued one of two domestic ducks that had sadly been dumped in a park. We named him Trevor. We would have to find a new home for him, so she brought him home for a short stay in the bathroom. After she left the house to attempt to capture his mate, the kids, who had no idea, came home to find a random duck going on a rampage destroying the bathroom. Hey, dude. Um... I think you knocked some stuff over. Um, can we pick up the, the table, please? Oh, there's poor everywhere. Please get down. Um, okay, I'm gonna back away now. Meanwhile, in the shed, everything with the net launcher was progressing nicely. We are now at a point where we can step back and have a bit of a look at our game plan. We have our end caps, and then I have some couplings that will be going into the sprinkler valve. One will be welded onto the pressure tank, and then the other will have two barrels welded on, where the weights for the net will be farted out. And then on the other end, we have our pressure gauge and a tyre valve that I cut out of my kid's bike tyre. I cut the rubber to expose the brass valve underneath. I worked out where I wanted it and hammered it through. But I thought it would be a bit leaky, so I ended up using a tubeless rubber valve instead. But this doesn't really help my son's bike situation. I've then installed a pressure gauge in the tank, so we know how much air we've managed to squeeze in. Now I just need to weld this coupling on the end, and once again, circles have come to haunt me. And not just because of their confusing terminology. I mean, a, a second? A scant? What is that? That's not a real thing. But also because I can't cut them. So I just had to chain drill it, then chisel and file the crap out of it for about an hour. But then I ended up with this shape, which I believe is called an annulus, and I think that's probably where the word anus comes from. I guess I've made a steel butthole. But when it comes to straight cuts, we are all good. This six-sided octagon I made fitted on perfectly. I then had to weld these barrels on for the weights. Luckily the barrels are exactly one drill bit in diameter, which I used to drill some holes for them. With all the difficult material preparation complete, we could then start gluing things together with electricity. Well, that's what I thought until my MIG welder decided to die. I did a bit of troubleshooting, like checking I hadn't run out of wire and that there was electricity inside. It turned out to be a broken connection, probably from welding too many pairs of scissors together in my last video. But then we were back in business. With that done, you are ready to install your new Stano tailpipe for some hatchback street cred. But if you were accidentally building a remote controlled net launcher instead, you would have just completed welding on the two barrels. However, I've just realised that if I drop the weights in there, they're just going to fall straight through into the abyss of the air tank. So I'm going to weld some bits of wire across the inside. Then our stop sign gets welded onto the coupling, and it was all really starting to take shape. Meanwhile, in the house, I had to put in place some safety measures for the escalating duck Trevor situation, including a Wi-Fi camera to check he was on his best behaviour. He wasn't happy that I removed all the loose items from the bathroom, so he was having a sook and staring at the wall. With duck Trevor busy, I could then screw the pressure gauge in and put a heap of thread sealing tape on the couplings so I could attach the sprinkler valve and the front barrels. And then we could give it a pressure test. It seemed pretty good. On the end where the welder was working perfectly, but then on the other end, where the welder was working terribly, it sounded like some kind of zombie mouse colony. 
So I had to re-weld everything on this end. But then we could finally put a little bit of pressure in and give it another test. That seems to be holding air well. Now, because the weights don't fit perfectly in the barrels, I'll be using some wadding that we put in first each time. But I figured it was ready to do some initial tests with just the wadding jammed in there. So at first I wasn't completely sure what happened here. We can see one of the bits of wadding shoots out as soon as I press the trigger, and then the second one comes out at full speed a second later. This seemed to happen again and again, but then I figured out it's just how these valves work. There's a rubber diaphragm in there, and in order for it to open, this electronic solenoid lifts up and lets a little bit of pressure leak through a sneaky Egyptian pyramid style side tunnel to the other side of the valve. Then this pressure change makes the whole diaphragm open up completely. But the problem is this initial leak of air vents into the barrel and pushes out the loosest bit of wadding early. So to sidestep this, I've just glued up the secret passage and drilled a larger hole in the front, which might make it open a bit quicker as well. So we'll give that a little test. That's working heaps better now. And that's actually quite satisfying to watch in slow motion. I also like how you get these multiple vapor puffs after the wadding fires out too. I'm not sure what causes that, but if you do know, put it in the comments. Then to get the bores of the barrels a bit smoother, I just kind of came up with this idea using an old bird's perch, which seemed to work pretty well. Even my pet bird enjoyed it. We're now ready to test it with some weights in the barrels. I've put a bit of string on there just so I don't lose the weights in the abyss of the shed forever. But it's looking pretty good and we can move on to the net component. To hold the net, I just ended up using an old spray bottle because it was about the right size and shape. Then I just welded up a mount for it and bolted it on. Then to hold all this in place and allow us to point it at things, I have this tripod which you may remember from its previous starring role as a light stand in my cat repellent videos. I gave it a new outfit, then I made a bunch of brackets to mount the net launcher on top. Then I got it nicely painted up, but left the stainless steel on show, mainly because I was running out of paint. Then I could do the final assembly, and there we go. It looks like the love child of a telescope and some lab equipment. Now, because we have to be so far back as to not scare any birds away, we're not going to be able to have any good perspective on whether a bird is in the capture zone or not. So I'm putting a camera on top so we can see what's going on via a monitor. This will be next to me and the trigger button. For now, I'm just gonna hardwire it via a 25 meter long cable just to try and make it simple and hopefully present less problems than if it was wireless. Then it was just a case of lots of soldering to get all the power and trigger button working. So the rescuers that were attending the scene regularly had told me that the bird was hyper aware of any changes that were out of the ordinary. I then couldn't help but notice that Kristen has lots of khaki green clothes in the wardrobe, which she now doesn't because I cut them into strips, sewed them together to help make this whole contraption blend in with the environment more. There we go. As far as any birds are concerned, it's just a regular rolled pressurized T-shaped tree that has an eye on top and spits out nets. I packed the wadding and weights into the barrels as well as an extra bit of wadding to stop the weight falling out and then really carefully pack the net in so hopefully it would open nicely. We are now ready to give this a proper first test firing. That worked pretty well and it's only at half pressure. I think Kristen's impression summarizes it well. But now for a slow motion shot. You can tell because of the slow motion dramatic music. Now, despite mounting the camera fairly high, it's hard to get perspective on where the net's gonna fly out to. So to help us be completely confident when to press the trigger, I have used my amazing programming skills and drawn on this plastic sheet. Could then give it a bunch more test firings. It's all looking good so far. The weights are flying well and the net's opening nicely. I added some chalk dust too for some of the test shots, not only because it looks cool and makes the shed air unbreathable after you fire it, but it really shows how the air is behaving as it pushes the weights out of the barrels. After a bunch of tests, 
already it's definitely opening a lot more consistently than a handheld net launcher which is good now what we need is a nice easy target to practice on old frosty eye the hawk should do nicely and frosty eye is captured i don't think he really cares though he probably hasn't noticed because of his cataracts out of a bunch of tests the net only fell short twice and i think it's because i didn't pack the net perfectly The other thing I noticed when the net fell short, the initial string tension on the weight seemed to be a factor. Maybe the weights need to get up to speed a bit more before they have to pull the bulk of the net out of the head, unless I'm missing something else. But it was definitely more consistent once I left a little bit of slack in the net. I also noticed if the two ground pegged corners of the net are too close together, the net can fly over your target. And with that, I'm pretty confident that we're ready to use this in the field to hopefully capture Aaron the Ibis. At the moment, packing and transporting this is a little messy, which involves some masking tape and a mesh bag to stop it vomiting its net contents everywhere in the car, but I may refine this in the future. While I had been wrapping up the last of our testing and refinements, a few days earlier, we had rigged up a mock net launcher dressed in the same clothes, so Aaron would hopefully be habituated to the new weird T-shaped tree and not be scared off when the real one is in position. The night prior to heading to the property, the local rescuer, Joe, confirmed that the Ibis had been feeding in front of the mock launcher consistently. So the next morning, we packed up and headed down. I rigged it up on the tripod, pegged out the net, and ran the cables to the monitor and the trigger, which was in a nice hidden spot in the backyard. Everyone stood out of sight, and we all waited. After the food was thrown, the local gang of Ibis cautiously wandered out of the woodwork of the nearby lake and over to the fence line. There's a usual gang of four Ibis, all have their own impairments, which is probably why they hang around in the first place. Wingy, with his droopy left wing, was first on the scene. He checked out what was going on, then he does a little zigzag U-turn manoeuvre and heads away. He waits for his mate Leggy, who has a twisted foot for a bit of support, and then they both head over to get a quick bite. Even though we were well hidden, they still recognise something different is going on and don't hang around long each time. I keep an eye on the monitor and listen out for a call if the correct Ibis is in the capture zone. I also realise I probably shouldn't have set up in an ant nest. We all keep waiting. Three of the gang of four are now on the scene, running in, taking food and retreating. However, Aaron the Ibis still hasn't shown up yet. We continue waiting. Then after about an hour, Joe starts to look around the property and the nearby lake, but Aaron is nowhere to be seen. After the other Ibises lose interest in the food, we decide to set the mock net launcher back up and then have the property owner keep an eye out. Even though a few days pass, he isn't seen again. Sadly, it looks like after around 51 days, Aaron the Ibis must have finally succumbed to his injuries. It would have been nice if it could have ended differently for the Ibis, but I guess this really does quite accurately portray the reality of wildlife rescue. Sometimes things don't always work out the way we would have liked, but for the times it does work out, it's well worth the effort. And there's always a lot to learn along the way. On a happier note though, Duck Trevor is no longer destroying our bathroom. Kristen and Rachel's efforts to catch Trevor's evasive brother from the lake, who they named Rambo, had paid off and the siblings were reunited. Fortunately, a new home was also found for them. After a fairly long car ride, they were then introduced to their new roommates. They were a little bit hesitant to come out at first, but the brown chicken-shaped ducks were very accommodating. They then settled into their new yard and checked out their new bedroom. At some point, there will very likely be a situation where the remote-controlled net launcher will be needed, and I'll definitely share a video of that one day. But feel free to subscribe if you want to see how it turns out in the future or if you just want to see me make other things out of shiny bits of metal and old plastic bottles. YouTube channel is Turner81, and I will catch you next time.